was defending herself against a rapist, Rehane Jabari was executed by the Islamic Republic uh, in disregard and defiance of the uh, condemnation uh, of the international community and calls to spare her life. And it's a sad day because it's a reflection of how tremendous uh, the challenge is that lies ahead of us in moving from this despicable reality to what perhaps UN bureaucrats and academics very casually talk about as a culture of human rights. We've heard that word so often. But what does it really mean to create a culture of human rights? What does it mean to create a culture which values human dignity? And beyond condemning the inevitable characteristic cynicism of power, the failure of state institutions, the failure of the international community, what is the role of this thing which we call the people in bringing about that culture? The title of my talk, Grassroots Justice Itself, requires some reflection. Because grassroots without justice is not necessarily a good thing. What is the difference that divides the idea of the voice of the people, this democratic impulse we have to say that something which comes from the people is good? It is a reflection of our equality. It is a reflection of our dignity. It is the contrast to elitism and exploitation and tyranny and so on and so forth. What is the difference between that and the violence of a lynch mob, which also is another perhaps unfortunate expression of people power. So the issue is one of quality, is it not? The issue is what are the beliefs that we hold on to? And more important than the beliefs that we espouse, what is our own behavior towards each other in civil society, in our relations, which ultimately is the only basis for bringing about meaningful change in society. People's tribunals can be seen, as the previous speakers have mentioned, as a substitute where the state and the international community fails people. People must rely on themselves in order to bring about justice. One could alternatively say that it is not just a substitute, but it is also a supplement, that even if we do have an international criminal tribunal for Yugoslavia or Rwanda or an international criminal court, which can and does exercise jurisdiction, that given the nature of mass violence, it is still necessary for people, whether through the medium of tribunals or other initiatives, to reckon with their own past, rather than simply assume that those in positions of power and formal institutions will bring about the changes that are required to heal the wounds, to reckon with the past so that we can build a better future. So I want to reflect on the context within which the Iran tribunal operates. What is the historical context in particular that brought about those crimes <coughs> to begin with? And what was the role of the Iranian people not just the Islamic Republic of Iran, not just the international community, but where were the Iranian people in 1988? How is it that this unspeakable crime transpired? Because it didn't just come out of nowhere. It didn't occur in a vacuum. There was a context, and it's very important to learn lessons from that context. We know, of course, about the role of mobs, political violence, we have the famous story about the mobs that helped overthrow uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh in Iran in 1953. Very often this is blamed on Operation Ajax and the CIA and the beginning uh, uh, of the end, in a sense, of American isolationism and the overthrow of many regimes uh, which began with Iran, went on with the Arbenz regime in Guatemala and so on and so forth. But what was the role of the people in Iran in the midst of that mob violence? Where were the ayatollahs and the clerics? What was their interest in the overthrow of Mossadegh? And one could go on to look at that chapter in Iranian history, 
and draw many different, perhaps disparate lessons from it. But if we fast forward to the revolution which began in 1978 and which materialized in 1979, what was the world, what were the leaders of conscience saying about Ayatollah Khomeini? Where one Michel Foucault called him the Iranian Gandhi. There was a great celebration when the Ayatollah came to power because of the assumption that anything would be better than the tyranny of the pro-American regime of the Shah. And the mobs in this case were not the isolated thugs which were mobilized perhaps by the CIA to overthrow Mossadegh, but there were millions, millions and millions of Iranians that welcomed Ayatollah Khomeini when he flew back from Paris. And there were millions that turned a blind eye as the executions began, first of the members of the imperial government. It was all right if the body of Prime Minister Hoveyda was shown uh, in a most humiliating and humane fashion on the front pages of Iranian newspapers, because after all, he was the embodiment of the evil of the previous regime. And then there were the mass executions of the Kurds, who of course were rebellious, so no one really paid much attention to the mass murder of the Kurds, as Ayatollah Khalkhali, the hanging judge, went about committing these atrocities. Then there were the killings of the Baha'is, and then by 1981, we began with the killings of the erstwhile allies of the regime, the various leftist groups ranging from Mujahideen Khalq to Fadayan Khalq and so on and so forth. So there was a context, a context that we have to honestly recognize of accepting violence, accepting violence in the name of justice. And once you introduce a culture of violence, once you legitimize that as an instrument of power, especially when you introduce it as a justification for a progressive cause, we fall into the trap of letting the ends justify the means, forgetting that the ends and the means are inextricably tied with each other. Now let's look at the wider context of what was happening in the region at the time. In 1980, Saddam Hussein invaded the province of Khuzestan in Iran. Thus began an eight-year war which claimed an estimated 500,000 lives. In 1988, when some 200,000 Iraqi Kurds were gassed, the world said nothing. The Western powers were more than happy to support Saddam Hussein. And I would even say that our many intellectuals, which were very happy to look at the situation of Palestine, were not really that concerned about the mass murder of 200,000 Kurds because it somehow didn't fit into the anti-imperialist narrative because the crime was committed in the name of Arab nationalism. And if we look to the east of Iran, to Afghanistan, where in 1978, a communist coup resulted in the mass murder of an estimated 20,000 people in just one year before the Soviet invasion, which between 1979 and 1989 killed an estimated one-third of Afghanistan's population, displaced another third, leaving one-third brutally traumatized, surviving under the most extreme circumstances. So we shouldn't be surprised about where Afghanistan is today. We shouldn't be surprised in particular that the Taliban emerges among the Pashtun of the South, which were the biggest victims of the Soviet policy of genocide. So what we see is a region that is mired not just in violence, but in extreme violence, in radical evil, to quote Hannah Arendt. How do you take that context, how do you take these deep wounds and try to build a culture of human rights? How do you nurse to health this body which is seemingly beyond repair? I wanted to give this context to explain what the problem is when we're trying to build a culture of human rights. If we look at the examples of Iraq, Arab nationalism, we look at the example of Iran, political Islam, and we look at the example of Afghanistan, communism. We see three 
seemingly totally different contradictory ideologies, all at variance with each other. But all of them are resorting to mass violence as an instrument of power. So the issue is not ideology. The issue is much more fundamental than that. The issue is the nature of power. The issue is how we as people construct our image of human dignity and power. And the issue is the disparity between paying lip service to progressive causes and actually critically looking at our own behavior, our own aspirations, and the leaders which, in some respects, we have imposed on ourselves. These are very painful historical mistakes. I think it's in that context that we have to understand the potential and the limits of the Iran Tribunal and the wider human rights movement which has emerged in Iran thanks to 35 years of totalitarian violence, which has disabused people of the illusion of the utopias which ultimately are going to swallow the children of the revolution. So what is impunity? Impunity is a failure of the state to protect its citizens against violence. But beyond that description, impunity is a betrayal. It is a betrayal of trust. It is betrayal of the trust that we place on our leaders, on our institutions, on those with power. And once we are betrayed in that way, we have two options. One is to become cynical, despondent, and defeated. The other is to fight and reclaim our own humanity through our own efforts. This is why the idea of victim empowerment, the idea of grassroots justice, is so appealing. Because victims refuse to be objects of pity, they become survivors, they become agents of change. And in their ceaseless demands for justice, as we see in the expression of the mothers of Khavaran, more recently the mothers of Lolle Park, or in other places in the world, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, and one could give many, many examples, in the demand of victims for justice, in their refusal to surrender hope, we see the most powerful expression of human dignity. Sadly, sadly, we are reminded of the power of human dignity because of that extreme violence. Because in other times, when power is becoming corrupt, when power is moving towards extreme violence, all too often, we're complacent until it's too late. When we talk about justice by the people, for the people, I think it's important to understand here, I would say a distinction between the Iran Tribunal and the Russell Tribunal. The Russell Tribunal, as commendable as it is, uh, in shining a, a spotlight on the uh, atrocious American war crimes in, in Vietnam, was perhaps uh, an exercise by the glitterati of the uh, intelligentsia at the time, whereas the Iran tribunal really is an expression of grassroots justice because it was driven really entirely by the survivors, by the families of the victims. And in many cases, despite all the attempts to smear the tribunal as some sort of, I don't know, CIA Mossad operation to justify the invasion of Iran, it's extraordinary. The conspiracy theories that people came up with, I think that these people should become Hollywood scriptwriters. Um, but the idea of people who sacrificially, people who are refugees, live very, very modest lives, who sacrificially gave of their time and their financial resources to make this tribunal, I think is a very powerful aspect of the tribunal that goes unnoticed, that goes unseen. So when we look at the participation of those that were directly affected, we begin to see that it's not just a commendable initiative, but it's a way for those people to reclaim their humanity. It's a way for those people to heal the wounds that have been eating away at them like a cancer for many years as they sat in silence.
The fact that all of us who joined this effort that was driven by the survivors, the families of victims, contributed on a voluntary basis, I think is also something very important. Because in the beginning, there were talks about paying salaries. And there was unanimous agreement that we would have none of that. Because this was really about something other than what we do as legal professionals. This was really a, a labor of love for all those that were involved. And I don't use that word casually, because by the end of the tribunal, those of us who were there, who witnessed the stories of almost 100 witnesses, Mother Esmat, others who are in this audience, who with extraordinary courage could come and unburden themselves of these unspeakable tales of suffering. By the end of the London and the Hague phases, when we had been shaken to the core by these stories of cruelty, when the judges of the tribunal came into the room to deliver their final verdict, there was a moment which I will never forget. And that's when all of those in the audience stood up with their pictures of their loved ones, as if those loved ones were present in that room. That was really a labor of love. And I say that because we have to understand the difference between the psychology of hatred, which dehumanizes people to justify their victimization, and that expression of dignity and love which allows people to once again realize that the way in which their humanity was denied does not reflect who they are. And I've dealt with victims, Bosnia, Rwanda, Guatemala, Cambodia. Each of them has their own historical cultural specificity, but the story is always the same. The story is always one of people moving out of the darkness into light and rediscovering their humanity. And I must say it was an extraordinary process of uh, healing for all of us who in one way or other have suffered from the crimes uh, of the Islamic Republic. Because it shows us that justice is something more than putting a defendant in the dock. Yes, it would have been nice if Ismail Pur Mohammadi, the Minister of Justice of Iran, who was a member of the Death Commission in 1988, was sitting in a dock having to answer to the mothers who lost their children. Yes, it would have been nice if there was a court that could order compensation to the victims. But somehow, at some point, at some level, it didn't matter. The mere fact that the truth was finally coming out after years of silence the mere fact that those who had suffered for so many years were given an opportunity to find some measure of healing justified that tribunal whether or not there was a defendant in the dock. And let's say that there was a defendant in the dock, which I think is a great idea. But as Hannah Arendt said after the Nuremberg judgment, these crimes explode the limits of the law. Their monstrosity lies in the fact that no punishment is enough. How do you punish someone for executing 5,000 people? Let's say we went back to medieval torture and boiled them alive and cut them to little bits. It's still not going to bring back the dead. It's not going to fix people who are broken forever for having lost their loved ones. So we have to understand justice in that context, in that aberration, in a very different light. It's about building a new culture. It's about learning historical lessons. And the most important lesson is that human rights is about the dignity of the human person, irrespective of ideology, irrespective of political and religious beliefs. When I uh, was involved in two cases against uh, Donald Rumsfeld before the US Supreme Court, uh, Hamdi versus Rumsfeld, Padilla versus Rumsfeld, some of you may be familiar with those Guantanamo Bay cases, many of my friends thought I'd lost my mind. And they were very angry with me, saying that here are these Al-Qaeda terrorists, and of all the potential causes in the world, 
why are you worrying about this? I said, well, that's what human rights means. That even if this man is the embodiment of all evil, whether he is or not, is not my business. Every human being must be treated with dignity and with fundamental rights. And one of the lessons we have to learn in our own midst in Iranian society is why we didn't pay more attention to the mass murders of 1988. Is it because we don't like the Mujahideen Khal? Is it because we don't like this or that political faction? Is that what a culture of human rights is all about? So the reckoning of the Iranian public with those crimes is about learning those powerful lessons. I want to just quickly speak about what I think the Iran tribunal achieved in the immediate term and what it may achieve in the longer term. After the Iran tribunal verdict, or rather by the time the verdict had come out, we realized that the verdict was really besides the point. It was the process. The process was the most important aspect of this. Just as we look at the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which issued 22 volume uh, report on its deliberations. Well, how many people have actually read those thousands of pages of testimony? What was important were the thousands of people that had the opportunity to tell their story. That was the collective healing which South Africa needed to go through in its transition from apartheid to multiracial democracy. The biggest success, or one of the biggest success says of the Iran tribunal was the extensive media coverage that it received. Of course, there were broadcasts of the BBC World Service, the New York Times, The Economist, but much more important was the extensive media coverage within Iran itself, which after all is the primary audience in bringing about that change in culture that we seek. What is the population of Iran today? 75 million people, 70% of which are under 30 years of age. What do they care about? Well, many of them have lost hope of change after the violent repression of the Green Movement in 2009. Many of them indulge in nihilistic behavior. Many of them turn on Manoto Television, which is a station based here in London, which has wonderful programs that young people love about fashion and about trends and about all the other things young people everywhere like to hear about. Manoto Television had a 20-minute segment on the Iran Tribunal, which I think was one of the biggest victories of the Iran Tribunal, because their audience is at least 20 million for that program. So 20 million young Iranians who knew nothing about this chapter of their history, because even the so-called Islamic reformists are referring to the 1980s as the golden era of the revolution, even as they themselves are brutalized and terrorized by that same regime which the DNA of which is found in those mass murders in the 1980s. Some 20 million young people heard the voices of those like Mother Esmat and others, voices that were not mediated by some fancy lawyer or professor or whatever the case may be. And there's something about the raw voice of a victim which is undeniable. When someone speaks from the heart, when someone has suffered unspeakably, and they stand there, and I don't want to embarrass her, she's in the audience, and talked about how her 11-year-old nephew was hanged together with his father, another who talked about how her husband, as he was being executed in his last moments was comforting a 14-year-old child who was screaming for his mother. When you hear those stories, you understand what human dignity means. You don't ask, were they Mujahideen Khal or were they Fadayan Khal or were they Baha'i or were they Kurd? It doesn't matter. It's totally irrelevant. That behavior is so shocking, so totally unacceptable. And that, I think, was the great success of the Iran Tribunal to convey the unfiltered, unadulterated voices of the victims, and it had an effect. Why did it have an effect? Because soon after, for the first time since 1988, one of the websites, which is linked to the Islamic Republic, it was um, 
I forget the name now. Bostop. Wrote an extraordinary article. And I want to just briefly dissect the significance of the article. The article explains that in 1988, when pursuant to the edict of Ayatollah Khomeini, the fatwa of Ayatollah Khomeini, many political prisoners were executed, that the current supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, did his best to save the lives of political prisoners. It was something which I read again and again in total, total disbelief. Why? Because first, it recognizes that there were mass executions in 1988, because just recently, the regime, desperate to cover any trace of those crimes, bulldozed the bodies of those at the Khavaran grave. So they're even afraid of an unmarked grave. Secondly, it's unmistakable that the regime portrayed Ayatollah Khomeini's fatwa in a negative light because it portrayed Khamenei as someone who was resisting that fatwa, which itself is quite exceptional. And thirdly, in comical fashion perhaps, but still very tellingly, they portrayed Ayatollah Khamenei, the current leader, as a kind of Mahatma Gandhi type figure trying to save as many lives as he could. Such was the reaction to this extraordinary piece of propaganda that a few days later it was taken off. It was taken off that website. In another article, the regime tried to provide an international law justification for the mass executions in another website, where in a rather creative borrowing of the notion of enemy combatants, which the Americans used in the context of Guantanamo Bay, they said that, well, these people were enemy combatants because they were siding with Saddam Hussein, which of course isn't true because these 5,000 people had been in prison for many years. The idea that they were somehow involved in the combat is absolute nonsense. And under international law, you can execute enemy combatants, a kind of leap in logic. But then, of course, what the article casually ignored is that even if you can execute enemy combatants, which is not true, how do you know they're an enemy combatant if you deny them due process? But the point is that in both of these pieces of propaganda, we see a regime that has to appropriate the exact language that is being used against it. They have to appropriate the language of human rights. They have to appropriate the language of international law because they're desperate for legitimacy, because their legitimacy has been shaken to the core, because of those millions of young people that heard the voices of the victims. And that is a huge victory, a huge victory for those of us that I can fairly say never dreamt that there would be such an article. But I want to just end by saying that, as some of the other speakers have remarked, we have to understand that it has taken us many years to get into this mess and it's going to take us many years to build a new culture. We live in particular in the West, consumer culture, instant gratification, and we forget what historical struggles are all about. Historical struggles mean that you struggle even if perhaps only your grandchildren will be able to reap the benefits. And we've seen this in the case of South Africa. Who would have imagined that Nelson Mandela would be released from prison and become the first democratically elected head of a post-apartheid South Africa. We casually accept these because they have occurred, but it was once unthinkable. So in the case of Iran as well, we have to understand that the lessons learned from the Iran tribunal may be subtle changes in people's perception and consciousness, especially in a new post-ideological generation that no longer is interested in romantic political ideologies, but is more interested simply in having a culture that is free of violence. So the effects of the Iran tribunal perhaps will be written about in the coming years as we look back to where we were today and what a long and painful journey we have had to create that culture of human rights that we all aspire towards.
I want to end by reflecting on the power of the images that were created. I'm a lawyer. I'm someone who deals with words, wordsmithing, as we like to say it sometimes. We go to court. We want to put forward the best possible argument there is. There are international treaties and procedural issues. And it's somehow comforting to reduce <clears throat> the enormity of human suffering to the antiseptic uh, confines of legal process. And some of our anthropologist friends in this conference that we just finished spoke about the ritualistic aspect of legal process, almost like a s secular ritual, a dance around the fire to appease the anger of the volcano. In this case, the volcano is a totalitarian regime that has murdered tens of thousands of people that continues to execute the innocent, as we see in the story of Rehane Jabari. So there's something comforting about reducing the world to these ritualistic uh, processes and imagine that somehow we have rectified the past because we now have a judgment, we now have a record. This is just the beginning of the journey. It's just the beginning of the journey. What we have is merely a foundation, a tool for a very long struggle that lays ahead. But I want to end by maybe speaking about the story of a little girl who is drawing a picture. Her mother lovingly says, what are you drawing, my dear? She says, I'm drawing a picture of God. The mother laughs and says, well, my dear, nobody knows what God looks like. The child responds, everybody will know what God looks like when I finish drawing my picture. <laughs> so let us imagine that we are, each of us, involved in drawing a picture of the future that we seek. There is a white canvas before us. It is called the people of Iran. It is called humanity. And we are all participants. Each of us is going to put a little splash of color in one corner of this painting. What is it that we want to paint? What is the image of the future that we have? So I begin by giving an image of the future which may seem totally absurd to most of you, but it's an image which has happened everywhere else. And that picture is that of a woman who today is a political prisoner in Evin prison, who sometime in the not too distant future will become the first democratically elected female president of a free and democratic Iran, who will go with a bundle of flowers to the gravesite at Khawaran and in the presence of the mothers of Khawaran, apologize for the atrocities that were committed. Let us imagine that we have not an Evin prison, but an Evin museum, just like Auschwitz, just like Tulsleng in Cambodia, where Iranian students, boys and girls, go and see the photographs of the thousands who were murdered and tortured and raped in Evin so that they learn the lessons of the dark past so that they are never repeated again. So I'm confident that all of these things will pass and we will look back at the Iran tribunal as a point of departure, as a new awakening. Thank you very much.